Okay. So I just wanted to review, remember we were talking about the different ways of metabolic control between an example here we're using glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Just by the way, I picked up a couple more followers of Arabic names. <laughs> and I've had a couple that have contacted me asking if they could come work for me. <laughs> I just know I'm going to end up on some watch list. <laughs> Luckily, I won't, I won't say no. <laughs> I've got my passport. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But I uh, just really want to point out the fact that hexokinase 1, which what tissues typically utilize hexokinase 1? Those are the muscles versus hexokinase 4, which is used liver. And we'll, and we'll find out the pancreas later on. Okay. And... There are a couple things here, and the, the, it also has a common name, glucokinase. That's one of the reasons why if you wrote down glucose kinase or glucokinase, just in general on glycolysis, you'd get at least partially counted wrong, not completely wrong, because it's very specific for that tissue. There are the two points that we wanted to point out here. Which one has a higher affinity, a tighter binding for glucose? One, the one in the muscles, and that means that whenever the blood glucose level starts to dip, the muscles are going to get priority over the liver. Okay, the muscles in the brain and the heart and things like that, which makes sense. Okay? And it's only if the blood glucose concentration gets really high that now glycolysis will kick in also for the liver. Okay? And it always has, you can see, it still has a lower um, catalytic efficiency than hexokinase 1 throughout. You know, it's never as good. And the second, does anyone remember what's the second one? Most people can remember that part, but what's the second thing that makes hexokinase 4 so different than hexokinase 1? This is really important. What can it do that the other types can't, technically 1 through 3, but what is it not affected by? Right. It is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, which is the product of its own product. The other isoforms are, because that was one way that they get shut off, is if there's too much glucose 6-phosphate, they get shut off. Glucose 6-phosphate doesn't affect the one that's in the liver and the pancreas. Okay? And that's because the liver and the pancreas, but the liver does so many different things. That's where gluconeogenesis occurs. We're talking about the pentose phosphate pathway. We need to have it um, be able to do utilize hexokinase whenever um, the glucose levels are higher in general, and so therefore uh, it is not inhibited by its own product. So that's why you know, we went over these. And then, and then we went over the little cartoon here, and we explained that what happened. And instead, what it is affected by is fructose 6-phosphate, which is further down field. Because <laughs> remember, this is where the pentose phosphate pathway splits off and so some bottom in gluconeogenesis, but it's fructose 6-phosphate that if this starts to accumulate, that it's gonna come in and turn off the, the liver's form of hexokinase 4. GLUT2 is a transporter, and it's, I don't wanna use the word prom promiscuous, because that's not the right word, because it's specific for glucose, but it's, um, I can't think of the word, I'm missing the word, but what it's, Unlike what we see with nerve cells and a lot of the other type of transporters, is it allows glucose just to enter in through, pretty much through just diffusion. So the reason why that's important is the concentration of glucose in the outside will equal that on the inside. So that, that's what makes the liver and the pancreas, which why does it make sense that the pancreas will do something like this too? What does the pancreas do? What is it involved in? It's insulin, right? And glucagon and somatostatin. But yeah, so that's why it should make sense. Insulin and glucagon, you have to have the same thing here that's going on because they have to be able to know the exact conditions on the outside. And so the liver is that way as well. Whereas the other glucose transporters that we'll talk about later on for the other cells, they aren't, okay? They aren't as easily affected. They don't match the inside and the outside necessarily. Okay, now this is where we're up to to here, and this is fructose, um, I'm sorry, fruct 
phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1, versus its antagonistic enzyme in gluconeogenesis, which was FDPase 1. I'm going to call it FDPase 1 a lot of times instead of saying fructose 1 and 6 bisphosphatase. In general, what do phosphatases do? They remove phosphates, usually in the form of inorganic phosphate. Whereas a kinase, as we already know, they transfer phosphates at the expense, or utilize, I should say, utilizing ATP, GTP. Um, those are the Bs. These are antagonistic. They are controlled by multiple, multiple mechanisms. Allosteric, covalent, and this whole substrate cycling issues, which is really easy to tell here because... The product of one is a subject of the other one, and vice versa, and they're affected by different things. So it's like the, well, it is a textbook example of substrate cycling. And they are reciprocally regulated, which means when one's turned up, the other one's turned down, and vice versa. Okay. So. PFK1 is called the concomitant step, which is just a fancy word for means once the once it gets through PFK1, it's committed to glycolysis. Okay. So besides that, there I mean there are lots of regulatory binding sites which allows for fine-tuning, which makes sense. If it's what's really dictating what's making the pathway proceed towards glycolysis versus any of the other splitting off pathways or branches, then you're going to want to be able to fine-tune it. Right? And so we're going to talk about like what are some of the activators and inhibitors. And some of these we've seen before. Some of them are new. And why does it make sense? That's the real thing. Because a lot of this, you can start to hopefully see, especially by the end of the semester, start to see where a lot of this makes sense. I'm really hoping they put that together. And then the it can be covalently modified by phosphorylation. Okay. So here we go. This is just kind of a poor man's version of a no, McCain's Mitten kind of equation that we've seen, a reaction that we've seen in the past. So we have the enzyme activity versus the concentration of fructose 6-phosphate, okay, versus its substrate. When there's hardly any ATP around, we see this formation. When there's higher concentration of AP, ATP, we see this kind of formation. So... What, I'm going to start with the high ATP win. What shape is this curve right here? Sigmoidal. sigmoidal. This one, there's a little bit, but it's much less sigmoidal than the other one. It's more, what's the, op, not the opposite, but what's the other shape called? Hyperbolic. hyperbolic. It's much more hyperbolic. There's a little bit of a lag. And this is like the classic sigmoidal. Does anyone remember, what does that shape tell us? When it's sigmoidal... Um, cooperative. Either negative or positive cooperativity. Okay. <clears throat> or allosteric, just in general. Mm -hmm. So is ATP an activator or is it an inhibitor of this reaction? Oh, we got a debate. So which one gives you more activity? Low ATP or high ATP? Low ATP. So ATP is an inhibitor. Which should make sense. Why does it make sense that ATP would be inhibiting PFK1? Because it already has the amount of ATP. Right. That means if you have a lot of ATP around, you don't need to be making more energy. You want to start to store it or use it for other things. Okay. So, um, which makes sense. Whereas if you have low ATP around, that means you need more energy. Okay. So you want to upregulate PFK1. Let me move this one. So this is right out of your book. This one may be from the older edition. I forgot to point that out, that sometimes the figure numbers down here in the corner may be a little off because I took them from an older edition and rather than copy and paste over and over again, I just utilize the same. This is just, you know, the um, reaction generated by PFK1. So we have fructose 6-phosphate ATP 
making fructose one six bisphosphate ADP. We've already talked about ATP, and that means it's turning it off. AMP and ADP turn it on, and those were important because we already said in the past how when ATP is hydrolyzed, it makes one of these two. Okay, and so it should make sense if the concentrations get really high here, it's going to turn on this enzyme because that means that the concentration of ATP is low. These are the two new ones that we haven't really talked a lot about. Okay. So one of them is citrate. One is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Not 1,6, but 2,6-bisphosphate. And we're going to get to these individually. Um, Does anyone just off the hand, I mean, I would, if I could give bonus points right now, I would if you knew the answer to this one right here, because this one's a hard one. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a hard one. Citrate, where does it come from? Citric acid, Citric acid cycle. Then we're going to get to where, how fructose 2,6-bisphosphate comes into play. But yeah, citrate's going to be the one citric acid cycle. All right, this is, and I can tell you right now, I forgot to, I meant to do it, I forgot to look it up. These page numbers are wrong. But... On your own, there's like two or three little pages that just go goes over like ADP, ATP, and AMP. And so you want to look at that. And I mean, we've gone over that kind of stuff already, so that's why it's nothing really new. It just shows you how it affects the different tissues. Does anyone want to take a guess what this enzyme, what the K stands for in this enzyme? Kinase. And so this is AMP kinase. So it means it's going to be adding phosphates to you know, AMP. All right, so... That's why it's a big difference. Okay, so this is citrate. So we have the citric acid cycle. It's one of the first steps of the citric acid cycle. <clears throat> and remember, this is for aerobic oxidation of pyruvate. There were three possibilities for pyruvate for some organisms. For us, there, there are two. Um, we have aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic means it goes on to make lactic acid or lactate, um, what, which happens from exercising muscles and things like that. Whereas the aerobic is for everything else. When the presence of oxygen, we have plenty of time when the oxygen replenishes, and then we undergo the citric acid cycle. Okay. And we're going to see that citrate many times is a common signal of whether or not you have enough energy. So what happens is that when citric concentrations start to get high, the citric acid cycle, which I'm going to draw it like this. So I'm going to have, I didn't do a very good job. Here's glycolysis in this color. Then we have this, I call it step zero or my faith integration of Moses in the Holy Land, where we have pyruvate here, but pyruvate cannot enter in there. And so we have, like I said, a lot of times they call it step zero. Sometimes people include it directly into the citric acid cycle. Sometimes they don't, because it's not actually part of the circle. But the rest of it is the citric acid cycle. Well, what happens is once you have lots of energy, some of these things will start to accumulate. And one of these would be right around here, and that's citrate. So when citrate starts to accumulate, it's going to go back and stop some of these other enzymes further upstream. And it's not just glycolysis that it'll affect. It also starts to affect things like the oxidation of fats, the oxidation of proteins, where you get other energy from whether you need to store energy or whether you need to make more energy. Um, so when we have a lot of citrate, it means we have enough energy. So right. Mm -hmm. So that's because things start here to, to build up. Mm -hmm. It should make sense. Just like in the previous example with hexokinase 1, not 4, but hexokinase 1, when you, start, when you get the buildup of glucose 6-phosphate, it means you have plenty. This is just a little cartoon showing this. Same thing. And so on, on your own, you can look, look through it. It's just a little cartoony looking thing. All right. Here's the fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. And this one, unfortunately, is a busy slide, but there's not a whole lot I can do about that. 
Okay, I want to give you a moment. You may even want to, I don't know if you want to draw the little diagrams or something. But give me a moment to also get a drink. <clears throat> to look over all of it before we start to explain it. So now we're going to talk and spend multiple slides talking about fructose 2,6-bisphosphate because it regulates both PFK1 from glycolysis and FBPase 1 from, which is <laughs> fructose bisphosphatase 1 from gluconeogenesis. And this is a player that we haven't talked a lot about, which is glucagon. In fact, I don't know if we might have mentioned it in passing when we talked about something else. It's a time or two, but we really haven't talked much about glucagon at all. And then we're talking about the enzymes, and this is really going to have to keep writing out and saying fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We're going to have F2,6-BP. Okay. <laughs> It's to be quite wordy. All right. So, first of all, let's just look at the curves, and then we'll talk about glucagon and everything. So, this right here is PFK1. So, what metabolic pathway is that one out of? That's glycolysis. So, this is just the relative activity, how much Vmax it is, the fastest it could get of that as a function of its substrate. And so if there is no fructose 2,6 bisphosphate around, okay, then um, we can see here that we get this nice sigmoidal curve. In the presence of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, that curve gets shifted dramatically. Please note, this is, I mean, a huge shift. That's why they're showing this isn't a KM because this is only Vmax, but it's showing what would be, it, 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 is a, it is a capital K, but they don't call it KM, but it's similar to that, right? Here it was two, the K was two. Here, you know, it's, what was that, 0 0.07 or whatever. But it shifts it drastically to where anytime there's F2,6BP around, this enzyme is much more active. So is glycolysis going to be turned on or turned off in the presence of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate? it's turned on because that means it's more active. Now, if we look at FBPase 1, which is gluconeogenesis, whenever fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is around, it's much less active. So it's relatively turned, I shouldn't say it's not completely turned off, but it's down-regulated. It's more inhibited. This one's more activated. Whether or not that fructose 26, F26BP is present now we're going to get to glucagon. What is glucagon? Which people get glucagon and glycogen interchanged. Sometimes when they talk and also when they write. It has a lot of similar letters. What is glucagon? It's the antagonist of insulin. One could be Superman, one could be Lex Luthor. Or one could be Ohio State, one could be Michigan. Perhaps that's a better one. Because with Superman and Lex Luthor, one is evil and one is not. Well, coming from Michigan, though, some people would say Ohio State is evil. But still, you get the idea. They're antagonists of each other. <laughs> okay. Um, so insulin, we see insulin. When do we normally see insulin? When does your insulin kick in? When high blood sugar. So glucagon kicks in with low blood sugar. Okay, and so that's why we usually start to, sometimes I always have to work my way back and work backwards when I start talking about some of these metabolic pathways. So if we have low blood sugar, that means we need to make more blood glucose. So therefore, it should make sense that we are not going to do glycolysis if you need to make blood sugar, okay? Because it would be use, using it up. So in general, glucagon is going to downregulate glycolysis, right? Because you don't want to be expending that, that, that precious glucose to make ATP when you are, don't have enough glucose to begin with. So what glucagon technically does is it lets the liver know, okay, we need to make and release more glucose for the blood. Okay, the brain needs blood. Uh, needs blood. <laughs> the brain does need blood. The brain needs sugar in its blood, okay? There are only two possible sources here. We have glycogen. 
okay, which there are some that's stored. However, there's a problem with that. And your muscles also have some storage glycogen as well. And one of the problems is we just physically cannot store enough glycogen in order for that to be our only supply of glucose. And then second was gluconeogenesis. And the gluconeogenesis comes from lots of different things. We've already talked about pyruvate. We have talked about lactate, because lactate can be used to make pyruvate. We haven't talked about glycerol yet. And we started talking about certain amino acids. What's one amino acid that should be obvious at this point in time that can ultimately be used to make glucose? Because if, remember, for glucose, what's the starting point for gluconeogenesis? Pyruvate. What amino acid can be used to make? It's alanine. Okay, and you're gonna find there are other ones. So that's why, once again, a lot of times I have to just take a step back and think in the bigger picture here, like what's going on. So those are the two sources of glucose that, we, that the liver has. So glucagon says, okay, let's make more. So you can either, you may first want to start breaking down the glycogen that you have, but once again, we only have a limited supply. Then you're going to start using any pyruvate you can get, the lactate, which has been coming like from the quarry cycle, from the muscles undergoing anaerobic. Um, we'll talk about glycerol later on with, with, with that. And, um, and we'll talk about other amino acids. Now, whenever blood glucose is too high, the insulin signals for the liver to say, okay, whoa, we don't need any more, which I anthropomorphize everything, so obviously it doesn't say, say that. But um, so now the liver can use the glucose for fuel, and it can go ahead and start to store things. Usually people think, oh, it's going to store glycogen. That's not the only thing it's stored, okay? And... Another way that we can start to store things is to try acylglycerol, okay, which is a fancy term for what are those commonly called? It's 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 associated with fats, but what kind of what kind of lipid in particular? What is triacylglycerol? It has a common like common term. We don't usually call it. First of all, let's draw it. What is, so first of all, glycerol, what does glycerol look like? Because it's one that you're going to need to memorize. How many carbons does glycerol have? Three. One, two, three. And what makes glycerol glycerol? Three OH groups, which right now I'm going to put, I'll put it in a different color. We have an OH there, which I haven't put it on there. OH and OH. Okay. Now I didn't put the OH on there because off the top of my, uh, you know, that's where the O would be hanging off of. But what's an acyl? And the reason why is I wanted to point that out. What's acyl? It's what? Mm hmm And so what happens is the oxygen that was hanging off of that has now become, yeah, let me see. Oh, that's a carbon to an oxygen, and I'm going to call that R group. O, R group. Oh, I should have done this one in the direction. It doesn't matter, I mean, in reality, but I just didn't have much room. And then our group. Those are triglycerides. Okay. So that's why I wanted to point out. This is one of the reasons why people who have problems with what's called hypertriglyceridemia, like myself, why we can't, we're supposed to limit our sugar. I've asked that question before on, as a bonus question or even as a test question or quiz question. Just to see if people pay attention. Like, explain the reason, the rationale that someone who has problems with their lipids can't have sugar. Well, the reason why is because, and you'll find out by the end of the semester exactly how this happened, is the sugar, excess sugar, excess glucose can be turned into fats, to lipids. Okay. All right, so, you don't, so whenever the blood glucose gets too high, insulin, which is the antagonist of glucagon, tells the liver, okay, you can start using glucose for your own energy needs, which that's good. But you also need to start saving it. Saving it as glycogen, you can save it in the form of triglycerides. But you have to be able to have a quick response. Right? You, and then you may have seen where people who have, start to have diabetic problems or hyper, have hyper, all of a sudden they go into hypoglycemic shock. I mean, they need to be able to have quick responses to this. And one of the rapid response methods is here is mediated by this F26BP that we've been talking about. And so what it does is it activates glycolysis and it can deactivate or inhibit gluconeogenesis. 
Okay. Glucagon, by the way, the way that it does that is it stimulates adenylyl cyclase. Where have we seen that? What is adenylyl cyclase? What does it do? It makes a cyclic group, and what cyclic group in particular? What's the specific product that it makes? Cyclic AMP. It makes CAMP, which is involved in... Oh, I mean, yeah, all those GPCRs. I mean, we're going to find it's involved in everything. I mean, it's involved in lots of stuff. But the glucagon actually undergoes and stimulates and it in a little cyclase. So this is just a little picture here showing to re as a review. You know, whoa, what happened there? No, oh, come on now. So this was epinephrine and the effects on epinephrine and glucagon. So what glucagon does here with respect to glycogen, it's going to say, okay, tell the liver we need to break it down to make glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate is what's used to transport out for glucose. It's going to say pyruvate, and everything can be used to make pyruvate can come in and to also make glucose 6-phosphate through gluconeogenesis. It can go on. All right. <clears throat> and so glycolysis is going to decrease here, and gluconeogenesis is going to, to increase. All right, um, yeah, so that's why I just wanted to say, and that should also make sense for epinephrine. Epinephrine, remember, that's your, your fight or flight. It's gonna help when it get out the blood glucose as well. And then this is what's occurring there within the muscles. All right. Are there any questions before I go to the next? Awesome. Okay, so how do we make fructose? Two six. Don't get this confused with the one six. You may want to write that little figure down and that way you don't have to unless you've already got printed out the thing with the boxes from online, of course. This is, you don't have to write this part down. This is just a review from glycolysis or oh, and gluconeogenesis, for that matter. <laughs> While you're writing that down, I'm going to write this down. And that. What was the product in glycolysis? From fructose 6-phosphate, it made 1,6, one six. One six. okay? Okay, so this is from glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. All right, so if we do a review of it, we had fructose 6-phosphate, we made fructose 1,6-bisphosphate at the expense of an ATP. This would say ADP. That was really crappy looking. ADP. First of all, what class or classes of enzymes can do this? Kinase. kinase. What was the name of this kinase? Okay, this is phosphofructokinase. Do you remember what else? One. Okay. Hmm, we'll find out. All right, and then just to review from gluconeogenesis, we had, you know, phos uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate goes to make <laughs> F6P. <laughs> it kicks off an inorganic phosphate. So what class or classes of enzymes does that? That was a phosphatase. Does anyone remember what when the one was called? Okay, mm-hmm. Which they, a lot of times they abbreviated this way. But it's fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Do you remember anything else? One. <laughs> okay, that's a good review. So here we have fructose 6-phosphate making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And so what class or class of enzymes is it? <laughs> that's correct. This one is... P, F, K, T. 
too. <laughs> that's the significance of it. So if we look at the other side, and that's why hopefully you start to see the, the rationale there, we have fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate kicking off an inorganic phosphate to make the fructose 6 bis <laughs> that one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful. Peter Piper picked a pick up puppers, that kind of thing. Um, what class or classes of enzymes can do this? Uh, phosphatase. phosphatase, and so this one would be FBPase2. <clears throat> So the, 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 that's the reason why there are ones and twos. <laughs> I know. I tell you, it's Friday. I think we need to listen to the old Rebecca Black song, Friday. <laughs> okay. Now, one other big difference between this and, and FBP ACE one and PFK one that we've seen before is that those were two separate enzymes. Okay, FBPase one and PFK one are two separate enzymes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and this is just gonna show you. What's I mean? This is remarkable. I think what is really cool about this is these two activities are actually the same protein. This is a huge complex. It's called bifunctional but it has both activities. It consists of both enzymes. One side, if you want to think of it as that, is PFK2, and one side is FBPase2. Okay. What is PKA? We've seen it before. It's protein kinase A. Protein kinase A got activated by what second messenger? Cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP got created by what enzyme? Adenylocyclase. So that's why we're starting to see that this over and over and over again. And so what happens is this pro this protein, this huge protein. I've got a better picture coming up. I, I, I've got a much better picture coming up. Um, this protein, you can kind of picture because I don't want to give it all away. This has got two sides. Okay, one of them is the PFK two side. And one of them is FBPase2 side. And depending on whether or not it's phosphorylated, one side is activated. When it's phosphorylated, one half is activated. When it's not phosphorylated, the other half is activated. So something so simple like that dictates whether it's going to make F fructose 2,6-bisphosphate or if it's going to make fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, remember, the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate was in go ahead and go on to activate glycolysis and turn down gluconeogenesis and, and things like that. Okay, so now the little cartoon to show all of this. And I didn't put boxes on this one because we've seen one of these enzymes I should have. Just because you could have figured out some of the names of the enzymes here that does it. I mean, this is these are the two enzymes that activate the enzyme that act <laughs> so you can start to see it. I'm actually going to start with this other side, the right-hand side. Because what happens here, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I thought I was on a, no, didn't mean to do that either. Sorry. Here, we don't have um, the phosphate on, and so it's PFK2 that's active. So when PFK2 is active, then um, we're going to go ahead and undergo the process of making uh, the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, okay? Now, this CAMP dependent protein kinase is just a really long-term and fancy way of saying PKA, <laughs> right? Protein kinase A, and the A is because it was turned on by CAMP. And so what it does is, of course, it since it's a protein kinase, it has to utilize an ATP to ADP. And what it's gonna do is then it's gonna be phosphorylating stuff. And one of the things that phosphorylates is this big complex here. Whenever it's phosphorylated, now the FBPase2 side is active. So therefore, it's gonna inhibit glycolysis and stimulate gluconeogenesis. Okay. Now I'm gonna come back to this. So this was, 
I'm gonna have to work backwards. This is PKA. PKA is turned on, activated by camp. Camp got activated by psych by the adenyl cyclase, and adenyl one of the things that activates adenyl cyclase is glucagon. Okay, so therefore, glucagon means we've got we need we have low blood sugar. So low blood sugar is gonna activate this entire process in order to make the FBPase 2 active. FBPase 2 then can undergo and be used to you know, ultimately inhibit glycolysis and stimulate gluconeogenesis, in the sense to make more glucose. Now on the opposite side, we have insulin, which is the antagonist to this, and insulin's gonna activate, and this is one we haven't talked about, but you, you can fig figure out the class of enzymes because it's just removing a phosphate in the form of inorganic phosphate, so therefore it's a phosphatase. And this one has the generic name of phosphoprotein phosphatase, so that means it's relatively um, promiscuous. Just like protein kinase A has a generic name because it's relatively promiscuous, and so it does the exact opposite. And so now we've turned PK PFK2 active, it's gonna stimulate glycolysis and inhibit gluconeogenesis. <clears throat> All right. Finally, oh. oh boy. All right. I just want to quickly go over pyruvate kinase, which was step ten. In here, it's regulated a little differently in the sense that we have well, actually, a little differently than the one that we just talked about. It is similar in the hexokinase in the sense that we have an isozyme that's specifically for the liver. We have one that's for the muscles. So then what happens here is, in, I'm gonna start here with the liver. Glucagon turns on PKA, which we've just seen through a couple steps removed. But what it does is it's going to phosphorylate pyruvate kinase L, the one that's in the liver. By phosphorylating it, the liver now is inactive. Okay, so that way it doesn't, it can't undergo glycolysis on its own, but it allows for glycolysis to occur elsewhere. Okay, or I should say it allows for the sugar to be elsewhere. All right, now then what happens is this PP is that phosphoprotein phosphatase that we just saw in the previous one, and it does the exact opposite. Whenever it gets turned on by insulin because blood glucose is high, then the liver can also then go ahead and be, undergo its own you know, energetic needs and take care of things. And then this is everything that does glycolysis. And we've seen all of these before. Where has, whereas fructose 1,6-bisphosphate can activate the further downstream because we only have lots of it at the end of step three in glycolysis, which was that concomitant step, remember? The one that dictates it, it's gonna go on. And then things that turn it off Alanine turns off glycolysis, turns off the kinase, which should make sense, because if you have lots and lots of alanine, that means we had lots of pyruvate, so we don't need to make any more. And then some of the other things, ATP turns it off, which should also make sense, because that means we have lots of energy, so we don't need to make any more pyruvate. Some of the ones that don't, may, make, may not make sense at this point, but hopefully later on, is it still coa Acetyl-CoA is the product of pyruvate going on to try to go towards the citric acid cycle. It's also the product of when you start to break down fats. So if you have a lot of acetyl-CoA, that means you've got a lot of energy around. And if you have a lot of fatty acids, then you're gonna shut down glycolysis because you don't need it. Your body's gonna be able to utilize your fats, all that extra fat that's around, okay? All right, glycogen. We actually, I went down glycogen I don't know how far we'll get on this, but we'll go. We'll do what we can today in the last couple minutes. Like I say, a lot of these, you can actually start to figure out on your own. So the rest of this chapter will be, there's not very many slides left, there will be on the game for the exam, but like I said, there's, there's not a whole lot that you couldn't, shouldn't make, should start to make sense. Okay, so glycogen, the way that it works, is we're gonna synthesize it. It comes from UT, whoa, sorry about that. It comes from UTP rather than ATP. But it does that a little differently. Okay, so what happens here is we have glucose 1-phosphate with a UTP. And I hate the way that this 
but this is the only one I could find, <laughs> is it adds, that's a glucose, that's supposed to be glucose, it doesn't add the phosphate, it adds a UDP and it kicks off inorganic pyrophosphate. Okay, so when we talk about those, <laughs> what class or classes of enzymes work with pyrophosphates? There's a pyrophosphorylase, and so this one is UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. And the reason why this is not a kinase is because it's not the phosphate that's being added. It's technically, it's the whole base, the whole sugar, except for the inorganic pyrophosphate. Okay. <clears throat> so all this does is this, this is just an excellent, excellent leaving group. Just like a phosphate, it's an excellent leaving group. So the next, now remember, we're making glycogen from glucose. So the next thing that happens is we're going to have that big thing that what we just made is going to add the glucose that it has to the big chain that we're making. Remember, gly glycogen is this huge, huge chain that you're making. And so that's what this is trying to show. We have the alcohol, what will be the alcohol from the old glycogen chain comes and smacks what will be the new glucose on it and kicks off UDP. <clears throat> All right, so what class or classes of enzymes make things? Synthases, and what's the other one? Synthetase, what was the difference? What did synthetase require? ATP or GTP. This one doesn't, so this one is a synthase. So if you were gonna name it, what is it, what is it synthesizing? It's glycogen, glycogen, right? Because this is whenever you have so much sugar around, you're wanting to start to store it. This is, gly this is glycogen synthase. Um, then I'm just going to point out this, because I didn't make a separate slide. The one down here is you've got to be able to get the UTP back in order to keep doing this. And so this is where you take the UDP that you just kicked off, and it literally takes a phosphate from ATP, so that way you have the UTP and you have ADP. So what class or classes of enzymes transfer phosphates? This is a kinase. I forgot to write the other synthase up there. Now, this is, you can't really tell, but this is reversible. It's, it, it's supposed to show you that it's reversible. So a lot of times when we have these reversible enzymes, what kind of names did they have? Like they had those generic sounding names, and this one is. I'm gonna see this enzyme over and over again. Um, this is nucleoside, which means it can do any of them, any of the nucleotides, you know, A, C, G, all of them. So phosphate kinase. And so all of this enzyme does is it swaps the phosphate partners around. And so it's ways to regenerate whatever triphosphate that you're missing. Okay. And then finally, to add the branches, it's called the branching enzyme. Remember, just take them off. It's called debranching. All right. So I'll go ahead and I'll end class with prayer.